So I was really fortunate in that I, I grew up here at Penumbra, literally. I think I was on stage with my father when I was six months old. And he was like sword fighting or jousting or something during this scene, you know. And my mother slightly threatened my father and said, if you drop her, we're done with this theater thing. So this is our dressing room. You can imagine being a small child and encountering this kind of a space, right? There's fake blood. Like, this is an amazing place for a kid to be. So I used to love playing back here and watching the actors get ready. They would come in, like, really jovial and happy, and then they would sit down and they would put their makeup on, and you could just see this transformation happen as they got into character, and I was always fascinated with that. Growing up inside of a theater community emboldens you and helps you realize that the things that people dream of can become a reality. And that was a profound lesson for me as an artist and also eventually would be a very profound lesson for me as artistic director of Penumbra. Penumbra Theater is a African-American theater company that was founded in 1976 by my father, Lou Bellamy. Penumbra was born out of the Black Arts Movement, which was a time period when Black artists were really trying to create work that propelled people to care and get involved in the political life and the social conditions that Black people were experiencing. Because we come out of that time period, we say that we make work that is by, for, and about African Americans. We confront difficult realities here at Penumbra, but we do it in a way that feels I hope, challenging but deeply compassionate. Regardless of who you are, if you're willing to come, you're willing to invest yourself emotionally in the stories that we're telling, um, there's real transformation that's possible because of the kind of work that we produce here. I began working at Penumbra Theater almost 20 years ago. My dad had a conversation with me out in the lobby and he said, do you think you wanna do this? Would you be interested in leading the organization? And I said, uh, I'm 26, I don't know what I'm doing, right? Like, please don't ask me that now. And he laughed. And shortly after that, it, it kind of sunk in that, you know what, this is a place where I can really dig in, I can put, put down roots, I can make a difference here. Good to see you. <laughs> I'm just, I feel tremendously fortunate to be able to be here, to have the kind of team that, that we do and the kind of trust that we have from the community. Um, there's a great legacy here. I don't intend to change that legacy. I intend to strengthen and evolve it. Repeat after me. You are my other me. You are my other me. Quiet. You are my other me. Oh, it gives me chills. I know, it does. Make me <laughs> a little bit. So the young people who come here to Penumbra, you know, some of them think, oh, theater camp. And then the social justice element hits them and they're like, whoa. Be courageous. I am not weak. I am not weak. In addition to the plays that we produce, we train young artists to embrace their talent, their passion for the art as well as their potential for, for civic engagement. I carry attitude and responsibility. I carry attitude and responsibility. The practice of making theater is tremendously informative to the practice of being a good citizen. You show up, you give your best, and you rely on the others who have different skills to give their best. And then you invest in a shared vision if we practice that more as a society, we would be healthier. More theater, period. <laughs>
part of what I get to do is imagine curating a year's experience for a community to engage in black culture. But the thing that I didn't realize I would have to do is become an organizer. There is incredible disparity that's been documented, which shows that theaters of color across the country are not faring well. And the reason why is because there's a tremendous amount of discrepancy in who gets funded. And so in 2014, I founded the Twin Cities Theaters of Color Coalition, and we've been meeting monthly since, trying to think about the sustainability of theaters of color regionally and also across the country. My want is that by the time I'm done here, whenever that is, that we're done having this conversation, that we're done arguing for the worth and the value of theaters of color, because my father did that for 40 years, and I'm doing it now. And I don't want the next generation of leadership to have to make that case. I want that to be a given. Song poetry in the Hmong tradition is a, is a, is a method of carrying story. Kutia is a, a sequencing of language. Patterns of word that can carry the yearning and the hopes of a people together. My name is Zhuang Biya. I'm a refugee from the country of Laos. My name is Kao Kalia Yang, and I'm Bi Yang's daughter. 2016, I wrote the song poet. And the song poet, uh, song poet sitting right beside me right here is my father, a Hmong man, a factory worker from the Midwest, who will remind others of not loss, but of love. I was born with a love of language, a love of song poetry. From my earliest memories, you know, if there was a celebrated song poet or even anyone just singing at all, I would stand close to them, move closer so I could hear those words. I was a child who knew loneliness early. My father died when I was just two. My song poetry was my way of expressing what was in my heart, what was weighing me down, and that the wind and the world carry it with me. February 17, Daddy. All in the Tico Hia, 1984. Yeah. January 10, 1983. Daddy, that's your birthday. Yeah. Yeah, it's your birthday. Daddy, you're 23. When we were in the refugee camps of Thailand, I would sing, and I would sing so that the people who I knew had tears inside of their hearts that those tears could come out. And so in that way, for me, my process has been very communal because it was the responses of my audience that prompted my songs to exit into the world and to live on and on. In America, when we got here, I was unable to do what I was actually good at. The gifts that I've been born with couldn't translate. 
The refugee is inherently brokenhearted because how can you not, when you witness the, 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 the death of entire villages, your loved ones left behind? For the refugee to, 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 to survive in a country like this, finding food for the table, finding drink, all of these are issues of heartache, not just problems to be solved. Unless you've gone through war and unless you've left so much behind, it is an experience that is incredibly hard to translate into simple human understanding. When Galia wanted to write the story of my life, I said, don't write it. It's a, it's a life soaked with tears. It's too heavy for the pages. But more than anything, I think I wrote my father's story because people keep, you know, they, they kept on asking, where are your biggest literary influences? Where did you learn your love of language? And I used to talk about Robert Frost, and I used to talk about Louise Erdrich, who I thought was phenomenal and who, who is phenomenal. And then there was that day when I realized you know, my father's poetry. And the truth is, I think my father is quite an incredible man, incredible song poet in this tiny little language. And I understood the vast loneliness of that. To be a great song poet, to be trapped in a language that people are perpetually saying is dying, and he's so keenly aware. Isn't that the stuff of great literature? <laughs> I do song poetry, and I do it in understanding that because I've raised my children in a different country, maybe they won't understand all the nuances within my songs or even the language. Part of what I burn to do is to preserve this song as a gift for future generations. If they don't like it, that's okay, but if one of them should come searching, that it is there to be found. What's an Indian woman to do when the white girls act more Indian than the Indians do? My tongue trips over to Conchula, mumbles around the word Mataki Aswe. My Ojibwe's been corrected by a blonde U of M undergraduate. What's an Indian woman to do? My name is Marcy Rendon, my English name. My Ojibwe name is Awanakwe. I'm originally from the White Earth Reservation, but I have lived here in the city since 1978. This stack of books and this stack of books are all books that I have something published in. I write novels, short stories, I write creative nonfiction, poetry, I write the lyrics for songs for classical composers. I mean, what I say is I'll write anything that pays um, because part of what I've done is I have made my living since 1990 as a writer. And so it really does mean that if a writing opportunity comes to me, I'll take it. Murder on the Red River, which, where's Murder on the Red River? So this one is my novel that came out in 2017. I had had this whole career as a, working as a counselor and a therapist, but I decided that I would be a writer. And so I spent a year just really writing and it kind of took off from there. I'm a parent and a grandparent, and so for the majority of my life, I have always had other people around me who are dependent on me, who I need to somehow interact with and take care of. And so my writing process happens a lot inside my brain, where you can be talking to me and I can be, yeah, 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 but really I'm writing a story in my head. <laughs> And so then, by the time I get to the computer, I can actually just sit down and write it out because I've just been working it and working it and working it. 
So my book, Murder on the Red River, won the Pinkley Award for 2018 for debut women's crime novel of the year. With the crime, my topics seem to cover women, children, resiliency, the power of who we are as Native people. And the other thing that I always am trying to do in my writing is to present present day images, thoughts of who we are as Native people. I think that there's so much oppression in the Native community that reading the crime novels, there's always some kind of resolution, that there's a crime that happens, there's a character who is incredibly resilient, and she, and she helps solve the crime. Olivia's my nine-year-old granddaughter. She's enrolled at Leech Lake. She's an amazing mathematician. So I have 12 grandchildren. The oldest are two are 22, the youngest is two years old. And a lot of them are artists. Encouraging them to do the talents that they have in whatever form and shape that that takes and trying to show them that they could do anything and be their own people. You can do this, you can get on stage, you can direct, you can dance. It's like there's no limit to what is possible for us as Native people. Whatever it is you want to do, do it. When you start with this disease, you can still do a lot of things. But then as it progresses, there's more and more things you cannot do. Singing is one of the things that stays with you till almost the end. with dealing with something like memory loss. It's so easy to withdraw and then just feel that sense of loss that really overwhelms your ability to do things. Giving voice is affirmative and upbeat and encouraging and social. When you're there singing, I don't feel like I'm the caregiver or care partner. Mm -hmm. And Marv's a person with dementia. It gets you out into the community with a community that understands and cares. Thank you, thank you, we thank you. When you have a disease like this, I really believe you have to keep the mind going. And I want to be as functional as long as I can, because then we have more fun. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I found some old photo albums. Oh, yes. Aren't we cute? Ah, uh, yes. We do look like we're 21. Yeah. Maybe 18. <laughs> <laughs> and we can't, I can't help grinning. Uh-huh, yep. Yeah, yeah. Elaine and I met in high school, and I just thought she was the best looking girl in the class. When I first met Mar, I thought he was kind of a little arrogant, <laughs> thought he was Morgan. kind of a know-it-all. You were a pretty good-looking date there. <laughs> <laughs> Man! I got to know him as a person, and we became good friends and <laughs> went on from there. Uh, we had high school chorus. Yeah, we were in high school choir, and, choir. and then we just continued with church choirs mm -hmm. after we were married. We just got to know people that way, mm -hmm. and the Giving Voice Choir has just expanded that. Giving Voice Chorus is a chorus of people with dementia and Alzheimer's and their care partners. That can be husbands and wives, it can be grandmothers and grandsons, two friends, mothers, daughters. 
Love Never Forgets started out as a collaboration with McPhail, Giving Voice, and the American Composers Forum to create this new work with composer Victor Zupank and poet Louisa Kastner. The collaboration originally was supposed to be eight minutes of music that the singers would sing. But Victor and Louisa has so much material and so many amazing ideas that it turns out that they wrote nine songs as opposed to two because of the time they spent with the singers and the singers really felt involved in this. This is their music. I thought I knew a lot about this disease because I saw my mom live with it for 12 years. And I, saw, I thought I kind of knew the stages, the decline, what the characteristics were. And I realized I knew one person's experience. My father, for the last three or four years of his life, was uh, living with dementia. And so when I did see this uh, listing for this project, working with an Alzheimer's choir, I knew I had to do it. We gained so much material from the singers, giving us um, an inside glimpse of living with dementia, um, but also uh, the experience of being in this chorus and what their friendship and the music meant to them. The emotions were, were just pouring out, you know, from them and in turn us. <laughs> and it just became this, this project that w was really truly created by all 100 of us, you know? Yeah. <laughs> As this built, we realized that we had something very, very amazing on our hands. And we started talking to the Ordway about performing there. We didn't know if this would work because to have nine songs that are brand new was daunting. It was daunting for us. It was daunting for the singers, frankly. Uh, they weren't sure if they could learn all of them. And one of the things we have found out through the time that we have spent with them is that people with Alzheimer's can learn. Most likely this is the first time that a dementia chorus has commissioned a piece of choral work that they have successfully learned it and performed it. Hearing them sing and seeing them uh, triumph over this challenge of learning new songs and them singing their stories, well, it was very emotional and you know and I I remember crying like a baby. I just, I just couldn't hold it, hold it back. I think love is, is a really big part of this project. Love never forgets. No, love never forgets. You know, having the theme of a concert as being love never forgets and just embodying that with all the people. That energy just surrounded us. That love was there. Yeah. You never heard the language. What kept going through my mind in a way was we sold out the Ordway. <laughs> How many people can say you were part of an ensemble that sold out the Ordway and it was a hot ticket. Those kind of things, you know, they're the successes you need, you know, that really make it easier to go on and on. 
Sometimes you need that extra push a little bit, that this is what I need to do to be able to help myself and then help the others around me, and especially for me to help this person. It's been a wonderful journey together. We will do it till yes, the end. Till the end. Because yes. it's love. Yes. Love never forgets. This program is made possible by the state's Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund.